Hey everybody, welcome to Winner's Cast. I'm your host, Matt. I'm Drew. And we are missing a third. Our, our uh, the, the third member of our trio uh, is not here. He's on vacation. You said he's going to, uh, well, he... Florida, but you call it Alabama. Is what <laughs> well, it's the Panhandle, <laughs> so it's in a different time zone, even. <laughs> so he he went to fake Florida. <laughs> it, so it's it's where you go when you can't quite stand the mosquitoes and the hurricanes. Well, they yeah. get hurricanes there probably too. So screw Florida, stick in Michigan. <laughs> I mean, we don't have hurricanes here, guys. Um, we have other things. <laughs> All right. Anyways, welcome to Linux Cast. I am in one of those moods where I don't know if I'm going to be able to stay on topic because I'm all over the place, but it's fine. My toe is killing me. So <laughs> I slammed my toe into the wall. This wall, by the way, it's the, like this wall right here. When I was going out the door, wasn't paying attention and slammed my toe right into the wall, dislocated it. That's the reason why there was no lug this past week. Just professional tip here. Don't kick walls. Who knew? It's always been my. It's always been my <laughs> policy. Well, you, you, <laughs> <laughs> you're you're smarter than I am, Drew. I mean, you just you have to admit it. It's just. But <laughs> I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna do it, get it do it right. Get a couple uh, Percocets in you, then do the podcast, and then we'll be all right. <laughs> there was no drugs. They've become very stingy since the whole you know uh, drug thing happened. Yeah. You know, it used to be like you you got a little injured, they'd throw some something at you and this time uh, take some aspirin you're gonna be fine yeah i had knee surgery 12 weeks ago and they gave me enough for one day <laughs> you get one day i think when i had my first knee surgery they gave me 10 days which was like yeah. uh, and the second one they cut it down like half because they really don't want you to get hooked on this stuff which i understand yeah. but yeah also pain the bitch and i want, I want the good stuff anyways yes sir uh Welcome to Linux Cast, the the podcast where we never go on any tangents whatsoever. So, uh, this week we're going to be talking about Drew's second favorite distro, and I it's his second favorite because obviously OpenSUSE is his favorite distro. Um, <laughs> we're going to be talking Indeed. about Debian for the main topic for today. That should be very fun, and uh, I'm sure we'll agree 100% of the time. Debian is a great distro, even better than. Hannah Montana Linux. It's better than Hannah Montana Linux. Great. <laughs> That's going to make some news. I don't actually mean that. <laughs> anyway. Oh, I hope that you do, actually. <laughs> uh, it's better than Hannah Montana. Is, wait a minute. Hold on a second. Isn't Hannah Montana Linux actually based on Debian? Or is it based I on I have no Ubuntu? idea. I, re I thought that was a joke. I, so, I mean, I thought. Someone is in there chat. really something called. Yes, yeah. yeah. It, it oh, actually okay. Exists. I, I yeah. didn't even. Okay. I don't think it's. I, I, I don't think that it's still maintained because she hasn't been hannah montana in 20 years yeah um and that makes you feel old that that woman is in is well into her 30s yeah <laughs> i think actually i don't i don't actually know how old she is i i haven't paid attention to miley cyrus yeah, i don't know who miley cyrus is. i don't know her age at all <laughs> it's okay more familiar with her dad okay <laughs> that's that's <it>. fair enough <laughs> <laughs> achy breaky heart man anyways one yeah. of those moods anyways um but before we jump into the main topic and, and argue about whether or not debian should be uh the default distro we're gonna go around the horn which are not much of a horn uh this time uh but talk about what we've been doing this week in open source so drew take us away before i completely derail the podcast <laughs> I watched a couple of snippets from a Linus Torvald interview that came out this week. It was on a YouTube channel called Mastery Learning. And in that, uh, there was two snippets, different videos. And one was about the XZUtils breach and raises questions about trust and open source. And then there was another one on the future of AI and VR. And I just want to point out, that the last two Linux cast podcasts have mirrored these topics. And I want to know mastery learning. Are you poaching topics from us? <laughs> That's all I'm asking. And I put out a video this week on my NeoVim configuration, because without question, I am the biggest NeoVim expert that, you know, and I mean like that Primogen guy and TJ DeVries are hacks compared to me which is why the video has views out the yin yang. <laughs> it was a good video. Yeah. Thank you. 
Truthfully, the video and the script that I wrote about a month ago on installing X11 window managers made me think about installing Wayland compositors in the same fashion. And so I have separated my X11 project scripts from my Wayland project scripts and have been working on Sway this week and modifying the Bash script to support its installation. So I've been adding features and actually learning, kind of deep diving into Sway more and more. And, uh, you know, I, I'm used to using basically the same things over and over again, like Dunst and so on. But, you know, there's like the Sway Notification Center, which is really good software. It's very, very good. And, and that alone has taken me a couple of days to kind of go through because... You know, we're going to talk about Debian, but the, the difference between where the project is now and where it was when Debian Bookworm came out, very, very different. So that is the week I have had. Yeah, there's a, like, with the Xorg window managers, like, you know, X, you know, Xmonad and Debian, they don't change very much anymore. You know, so it's, so it's okay that you're using older stuff. And the Hyperland changes every day, and it's really hard to do. So, yeah, I, I completely see that. Just, I will say, though, that it is better than it used to be on the Wayland front because you don't have to use, like, that... You can use Dunstan Wayland. It supports Wayland fine. You can use Rofi now with Wayland, and it, for the most part, it works fine. There is a, a Wayland version of Rofi. You know, you can use... Yeah. No, you, I, yeah. you, you can compile the menu and get it to work with Wayland. So, uh, it's, you didn't use... Yeah, I do that Wayland. actually in the script. I'm, I'm compiling the Rofi Wayland version, the, the fork. So, yeah. But I like Rofi, so I want to use Rofi. But, it, it you know, definitely a little bit different. I don't have to do that installation uh, when I'm on X11. I can just install Rofi from the Debian packages. But for, for Wayland, very different, so... Well, okay, so for me, my week has basically entailed, I recorded the NixOS long-term review three times. <laughs> I finally published the damn thing today. So it's out. Uh, it took nine months. Um, and for those of you who wonder, because somebody in the comments section asked me, well, aren't you like, an, don't you use OpenSUSE? Yes, I do. OpenSUSE is my main distro. I have another hard drive where I do my testing, and I, and I have other computers that I do my testing on, so there's that someone also asked well your com your configuration is awful clean for using it for nine months that's true i had reinstalled nix os also i cleaned it up quite a bit i did some of it actually in the b-roll you guys saw me doing it in, in in that video a little bit pulling out stuff and i don't i didn't really like like just, just commenting out like the gnome section i just completely pull it out the same thing with the xfc thing which is what was on there by default I pulled that right out. I just didn't, I deleted it, and instead of leaving it in there as commented out section. So that's the reason why my configuration was so clean. Uh, somebody no noticed. I was like, "Ooh, there's no way this guy used it for nine months." I did two or three hours a day, and there you go. So I felt like I had to defend myself there a little bit because I worked really freaking hard on that, and I'm so glad, Drew. Just so glad that I'm done with NixOS. Like, there's nothing wrong with NixOS. I'm just I need to move on. I need something fresh. Uh, so. <laughs> I was gonna say, oh, so I'll use Debian. <laughs> I'm gonna have. Oh, okay. Well, I'm gonna have go. lo loads of jokes. Now, I put out a poll for those of you who are wondering what's next. I put out a poll. Uh, Debian wasn't actually on there. I've done Debian before, so I don't need to revisit. Yeah, not that, that long ago, even. Yeah, that was my last long-term review right before yeah. NixOS. So, Debian spoiler, really good distro. No matter what, no many, no matter how much I trolled through later on, it's a good distro. Uh, anyways, the choices were Void Linux. Gen 2 Ubuntu, which I found hilarious. I thought for sure Ubuntu would get some votes because, you know, who lives in Ubuntu these days? Like, actual stock standard Ubuntu, I'd live in it. And then the, uh, the other one was LMX Linux. Oh. Three right. of the four I chose because they're not systemd distros. So I thought I would live without systemd for a little while in the in the testing environment. So, uh, anyways, if you want to vote in that, in that, that poll is on YouTube and on Mastodon and on the Discord. So I'll add up their voice votes after the end of a week. And that's where my uh, next long-term review will happen. It will not take me nine months, though. Um, because there won't be anything hard to explain like flakes, which I still did a shit job. 
<laughs> it was really bad. I, I should have. I should. What I should have done was just given D Dubs five dollars, had him explain <laughs> flakes, and just cut that part in. That would have been the way to do it. Have him write your script for you. <laughs> it would have been way. Oh, well, the problem is I can't read scripts. I'm really, really bad at it. Like okay. I, it comes across as completely unnatural. I try. <laughs> I've tried. I'm, I'm not good at it. But I could have had him record it. He could have just pretended to be me for a little while during that section but yeah i didn't yeah. think about that until just now uh, anyways i did that what else did i do this week oh i've been rebuilt I, I talked about this i think a little bit last week I i'm still rebuilding my vm for my docker stuff I i'm doing it very very slowly because i'm not first i'm documenting all of it but also i'm i'm ensuring that i know exactly the best way to do each of these things and i'm learning as i go along how to back up each and every one in the proper way so that i get the the databases exactly the way they need to do because they all do it in a slightly different way because they all use like one of them uses MariaDB, one uses postgres one uses mysql and they all have different kind of ways of backing it up make sure you can transfer back and forth between places and i want to make sure i know how to do that and it's all written down someplace so i can get it in the right way uh, and, and then like fresh rss i Found, like my first installation of fresh rss had its own database i believe it used postgres uh mm -hmm. and, and then this time i apparently found a different uh tutorial on how to install it and this one just had me use mysql i'm not sure if one is better than the other i don't know anything about databases so uh, you know six and one half a dozen the other i guess we'll see as, as we go along if there's like a limit on mysql because kind of the only thing that i read was that mysql kind of has a like a limit to the number of entries or something i don't know uh, i don't know if that's yeah. true or not like it's the internet you, you, don't, you have no clue what's going on but anyways, that's basically what I've been doing. I'm, I'm hoping that I can finish this week actually getting everything over there and shut the old one down. Because I still have... The only things I have left are Nextcloud. Uh, I have to finish the setup with uh, Nginx and Cloudflare so that the Cloudflare stuff is set up correctly. I didn't do that right the first time. And I have Audiobook Shelf. And I think that that's it. Just those three. I, I did... I did vault warden and then tried to set up vault warden and it reminded me that i had to have uh ssl certificate and that reminded me that i needed to set up the the nginx stuff properly so it's been a process i i will say that it's been uh, it's drew I, i'm gonna constantly praise you this for you praise you for this for like probably the entire time we know each other uh that whole documentation thing that you put me put me towards i'm obsessed with it man like i have and it, it, it's crazy like if i write down like i have a, a one liner on for the nixa west thing that just tells you how to rebuild the system i wrote it down and put it on github <laughs> um like I, i'm writing everything down and put it up there and, and I, i'm re transforming my note taking thing again because I, i'm kind of shaping it around next cloud because i wasn't yeah. going to right so what i'm going to do because of the way that obsidian works i'm going to put my vault inside of my next cloud f directory and then yeah, i'm going to yeah. i'm, I'm going to point iotis towards that same directory i'm also going to put the documentation repository that i have inside of there so i can get to that in any of the note taking things i have so even if i need to do it on like my, my phone it'll be there and then i can just upload it to get when i'm on my computer so yeah. um i'm finally i think getting a system for note taking but uh, I, I get made fun of for the amount of times i talk about notes so i, I think we'll just pause there. no I'm, I'm in the same category as you i i want to be productive and i think the best way to do that is to a lot of times document what you're doing so that you don't have like you don't have to go hunting for how to do a specific process, you know, and it's just like, oh man, how did I do that? I have no idea, which is why we become YouTubers as well. It's like, how did I do that? I'll go back and watch <laughs> videos that I've videos. done like two years ago. Holy crap. Yeah, that's how I did that. That's I did the exact. So one of the first videos I ever made, and you don't need to do this anymore because it's much, much easier, but back then, uh, it was really hard to install Hearthstone on Linux. Like mm. you, you had to do a whole bunch of stuff, especially on a non-rolling release distro. You had to pull in all these extra dependencies and make sure you had all the Microsoft fonts and all this stuff, right? And uh, I, I made a video on how to do it, and then I got away from Hearthstone for a little while and then realized I wanted to do it again, so I had to go back and watch myself to, to install it. First off, some of those early videos, man, God, I was so bad at making videos, but also I, I wasn't very good at doing tutorials either because I missed a few steps. <laughs> it was really bad. So if you're going to do a tutorial, make sure you do the tutorial right because you, <laughs> you have some issues. 
<laughs> I don't I, every once in a while I'll actually have like an outline, but that's the extent of it. Just the outline and go from there. But I mean, I remember the, the uh, conversation I had on Brody Robertson's tech over T and it was just like, Hey, do you, um, do you write a script or do you do notes and stuff like that? I said, I don't do either. I don't do either one of those things for the most part. I just kind of start talking and seeing what, what happens after that, you know? So, but I think it would become robotic almost if you decide um, he does it though. I mean, he writes a script and then he delivers the script and, but he doesn't, it doesn't look like he's reading a script, <laughs> but he's really good at it. I'm just not. I try because well I think he because he puts out so much in terms of content he almost has to. Um, also, he's way better at it than I ever could be. Like I can't do the scripting thing. I try. I try. I tried first. I can write the script fine. I'm like I'm a good writer. I do it for for a profession. I can I can write like a mofo. I cannot for the life of me read it out loud and have it not sound mm -hmm. like AI wrote it. You know, like mm -hmm. it, it, it or at least at least like uh, not let it wrote it, but more like I'm an AI. Right? It, it's so stilted and not good. And also um, because I don't have the a fantastic camera setup to this, I have my webcam up there on top of my monitor, so. I I have to put the script in a certain spot in order to make it look like I'm looking at the camera, but I'd prefer to put it over here where it's on a big screen so my old man eyes can actually see the damn thing. Yeah. <laughs> and then and then I'm over here watching the cameras over there. It's 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 a comedy of errors. It's so bad. All right. Anyways, that's it for the our weekend, Foss. As as usual, we branched out a little bit there, but that's okay. We're moving on. So the the question for this evening, Drew, is, and, and I think I know the answer to this question. Do you, well, maybe not. Do you think that Debian, like stock standard Debian, I'm not talking about testing or SID or any of the stuff that Debian does, should be the default Linux distro? Yes. <laughs> okay. I, I was hoping you'd surprise me there. <laughs> no. Yeah, okay. So... Basically, using any other distro other than Debian is like ordering a burger at a vegan restaurant. It's it's possible, but why would you? I'm just putting that out there. <laughs> yeah. no, 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 I don't think that at all. I mean, I, I think that Debian is good for me. It, that's just the that's just the way it is. I think it's a very personal thing. But there's, I mean, we all know that there is a there's a drawback to having software that is on the older side and a non-rolling release. So there's that aspect to it. At the same time, there's reasons for having that kind of standardization. You know, with standardizing things would reduce compatibility issues between different systems and hardware and so on. So it would simplify support if you were to support other people like you know, if you were in a in a business environment, it would de it would allow people to have a single community that they could be that could become part of. But the truth of the matter is, no. I mean, there's so many other diff so many other use cases. There's so many reasons to to look at other distros, especially on the just looking at innovation. You know, just looking at innovation. You can gain a lot of innov innovation from a number of different areas. If you were just looking at one thing, you'd be like Windows or Mac OS or something. It would be kind of like, okay, well, this is what we have and that is all. And that's, that's no way, that's not the intent of our community at all. Okay, well, that was more level-headed than I wanted it to be. Podcast over. I'm just <laughs> All right. So let me be the other half of this argument then and, and argue the other side, which is not a position that I thought I was going to find myself in, but let me see if I can do it. I mean, I can argue <laughs> the other side. I can make it very easy for you okay. if you'd like. But So Debian is the most popular Linux distro. That's absolutely true. Ubuntu is based on it. Therefore, Debian is the most popular. D Ubuntu is not its own thing. Without Debian, Ubuntu would not exist. Uh, without Debian, uh, Linux Mint would not exist. Zorin OS, uh, any number of distros. MX? You can, uh, yeah, yeah, MX Linux, uh, Spiral Linux. You, you can name probably 100 distros that are yeah, somewhat based true. either on 
Debian or based on Ubuntu, which is therefore based on Debian. So the Debian is the grandpappy of them all. Now, I know the Slackware guys are out there like, oh, well, Slackware was technically around three months before Debian was or whatever it was. Like, nah, hold your horses, Slackware guys. Nobody uses Slackware except for Uber nerds, which is fine for them. But for most people, they're not using Slackware, right? And, and you know, Sousa was around back then too they came out you know like a year later or whatever so you know it would it's an also an old very old distro arch you guys are the new guys you have i i don't think arch came around to like 2002 or something like that so it's, you know whatever but the 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 thing here is that there's a reason why ubuntu bases itself on debian there's a reason why linux mint has a debian edition there's a reason why everyone that it uses either something based on Ubuntu or on Debian, uses the apt package manager because it's really, really good. And there's a reason why almost every Ubuntu-based distro also has a lot of stuff that comes from the Debian repositories because it's huge. Like, it, like Universe is gigantic in terms of how much software it has. I don't, I don't, I think it would probably beat out the AUR if you went and counted it package by package. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't, I let's don't know go with you, let's go with what you just said though yes yeah, sure right <laughs> I, I, mean, I don't i've never actually went through and counted all those <laughs> those i didn't have the time before the podcast but I, for for me personally i'm gonna have to argue against myself because because all that stuff is true like there there are really good reasons why you can point to debian as being the genesis of linux like Linux wasn't Linux until Debian came around. We, I, I think that that can be safely argued that it, you know that it was the like I said the grandpappy of them all. It spawned a ton of distros. It spawned innovation. Like you said, a good reason why it's not default is because other distros can you know innovate more than what Debian has in the what past. I was, you know what I was saying is from a broader perspective. You have more developers working on projects that they love, you know, whether it be Arch or what have you. And because of that, you're going to have more innovation for Linux, for Linux as a whole. Because if you were just looking at, like, if you were taking the narrow focus and say Debian is the only thing you can work on, then it would become less innovative. That's, okay. That was my point. Let's broaden it a little bit. Instead of saying... Okay, instead of thinking Debian as default as only, like the only one that exists, instead of just thinking of it as like the main one, right? Like the, instead of like, just because it's the default, because technically right now, if you had to, if you had to be asked what the default distro is, you'd probably say Ubuntu or you'd say Linux Mint, right? Because those are the ones that if... If your, you know, your, your nephew or whatever came up to you and said, you know, Drew, I'm really interested in uh, Linux. What distro should I use? You'd point probably towards, you know, Ubuntu or Linux Mint or something like that. For right? sure. Those are the, de those, those are the default distros, right? So what arguments can you make for, and we'll, we'll make some arguments against later. What arguments can you make for uh, Debian being the default instead of say Ubuntu or Linux Mint? Number one, stability. It is renowned for its stability. It, priorit it prioritizes well-tested software over bleeding edge updates. It's very reliable for servers, critical systems. It goes through maybe the most rigorous testing of its packages than any other distro, I think by, by a large amount. It has a massive software repository that you were already alluding to, Matt, you know, as far as the number of software packages, it supports multiple architectures. That's a big deal if you're talking about risk or, or you know, diff, you know, 32 bits, 32 bit, and, and it still has that, you know, it is community driven as opposed to it being corporate backed. And because of that volunteer driven, it provides, I think there's a strong community ethos uh, within the Debian community. It emphasizes free software, openness, inclusiveness. And as far as security is concerned, it has an entire security team that addresses vulnerabilities, provides updates. Its focus on security is why it's probably preferred on 
a lot of these um, critical systems. And I think it's more flexible than it's given credit for. As far as package management and derivatives in software installation, it appeals to, I think it, I think I'm going to argue a little bit against myself here, but I think it appeal, appeals more to advanced users and system admin than it does for newer users. But having said that, those, you know, just those things, stability, packages, community driven, security, flexibility, I think it has everything that you need out of a truly great distro. I'm with you. I think that one of the reasons why so many distros choose it is because of a lot of the things that you have to say. And and I think the biggest one that you mentioned there is flexibility. You can do, I, I mean, if you were to compare, say, Ubuntu and Debian, they don't have a ton in common. I mean, they have the same package base, but they do a lot of things that are quite a bit differently. They got, you know, uh, uh, Ubuntu updates itself a lot faster than Debian ever has and probably ever will, right? A and they have a much different ethos when it comes to package management and, and package release and all this stuff. But I don't think that if, if you look at it, let's just say for the sake of argument that Ubuntu would exist if Debian wasn't around. Let's say they would choose, let, let, just for the hell of it, let's just say, because Slackware, they were both released around the same time. Let's say Slackware was the same thing. Slackware, Drew, have you ever actually used Slackware? No, so no. Slackware has a package management system from the horror shop of horrors, right? And the Slackware guys aren't going to, to agree with that because I think that it's very flexible, but it's not... It's not as flexible, let's just say, as you'd want it to be. It's very tedious and it's very package based in terms of like everything has to be packaged in us in a, in a Slackware build, and you got to do things, you know, in, in the, the Slackware way of doing things. It wouldn't be easy to take that and put it onto another distro that does things not like Slackware. Whereas you can take Apt or you know Apt Get or Aptitude or any of these tools and very easily put them on another distro that's technically based on dis uh, you know Debian but it does things in different way you know it does things in a different way you know than what the the parent distro actually does and i think that yeah. that is it, it's brilliant it's just that it allows cuz the only other distro we really have that's like that is arch like there's a reason why there's 12,000, you know, arch based distros out there because you can just take that thing and build it up from scratch, but you, it's not so built up from scratch that it's gen two, you know what I mean? Like there, there's a reason why there's not a lot of gen two based distros out there because it's, it takes a lot of work and maintenance for the, for the, the maintainer to actually do that stuff. And oftentimes like red core has to maintain its own repositories because they want to have, give users access to software that's actually stable. It's oftentimes in a binary form. Now gen two has solved the binary stuff now, but it's still something that you very much have to build up from, you know, the ground up, whereas like Arch has that base, Debian has that base, and those are the two distros that you can kind of do that with. All the others, not so much, you know? No, it, those, I mean, uh, to your point, Matt, Arch and Debian are the building blocks for, I don't even, is it 90 plus percent of the distros out there? I mean, it has to be or close to it, if not uh, more. Yeah. And, you know, and here's the thing, like, okay, so if I am a newer user, to your point, when you ask, you know, do you go to Ubuntu or Linux Mint? The reason why Debian is the perfect building block for these distros is because if I was, to, <laughs> if I was a new user, had to install Debian, which isn't, which isn't the easiest installation in the world, and then I got to a vanilla version of anything, whether it be GNOME or KDE or XFCE or anything that's in that's easily installed uh, in the Debian installation, I would go. This is not for me. You know what? What Art? Uh, sorry, what Ubuntu and Linux Mint do is they prioritize user friendliness and come up with pre-configured software and graphical tools and make them incredibly accessible to newer users, to beginners. And that is why, that is the genius behind Ubuntu and Linux Mint is because they understand how 
awesome this building block is, and then they can translate that into this pre-configured software graphical tool environment that is easy for newer users. Yeah, Let, let's transition into the reasons why, just real quick, why it wouldn't be a good default distro. Um, you mentioned a couple times ease of install is like the biggest one, but also it, here's something that infuriates me, Drew, about Debian. The thing is, they've done the easy to install thing. Like, they have that option. They have ISOs on their website. They have the Calamari's installer. It's there, ready for everybody to use. You can go find it. Well, I mean, you can find it if you can navigate their website, but those things exist. And you, they put they put the work in to create those ISOs for multiple different desktops. Like, all the desktops and window managers you can find, they're all on the website. It's there, but they don't use them or promote them instead they stick with their regular installer and in order to do i mean one of the reasons why your channel is so awesome is because if you want to do butterfs on debian watch some of drew's videos because he's <laughs> going to take you through it but you'll also find that it's kind of painful to do if you want to actually set up the you know the sub volumes in the correct oh, locations yeah, and stuff nightmare. like that right for i mean it, now to be fair it's not like other distros make it any easier to use ButterFS either, right? ButterFS is not a default file system that a lot of distros actually use or set up correctly. Fedora and OpenSUSE really are the only ones that use it out of the box, and Fedora does it half-assed. OpenSUSE does it awesomely. Everyone should use it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you, you know, it, my, my point is is that they ha they, <laughs> they've gone through... And my biggest problem with Debian it remains the fact that they put a lot of work in to an Arco Linux number of ISOs, like a ton of ISOs, like, and, and you thought that this, you think that this would go down now that they started putting the the, the non-free stuff on the main ISO, but it hasn't actually gone down. The, uh, the number of ISOs they provide is still in the dozens. Like it, it's, it, dude. It's you know bonkers. what's weird is I don't even realize that, Bec and I'll tell you why because I use the net install every single time. It's just it's the one that's on the. Uh, homepage of the Debian.org website. It's like, click on that. I get the, the, the net install and I work with that and that's all I need. So I'm, yeah, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about all these other things that you're even talking about because I use one and that's the net install. Yeah. So if you go spelunking into the, the, the depths of the Debian website, they have a, a, several different pages of ISOs that you can download. Some of them are basically the the net install like you have but they're they come pre-configured with certain options yeah and, and yeah. It, it, i think they've toned those down now that the free not the non-free stuff is on the the main iso but they also have a page of live installers so basically instead of booting into basically like an curses thing or w whatever it is they actually use like the the thing you you can boot into a specific desktop like xfce right, or, or right. Uh, kde or whatever you can boot into that and then you then you launch the installer from there they have those and then they also and from those then you'd launch the traditional De debian installer uh they also have ones that are also live isos that boot into or will will install from a calamari's installer and it just, it, okay. it, it boggles my mind that they have all these things. And it's just weird that, I, I think that one of the things, and maybe you can correct me on this because you're the, you're the Debian user here, but they ha they're very attached to tradition. So like, no, <laughs> <laughs> like their tradition is to have that net installer that looks that way. That installer hasn't changed in a very long time. No, that's fair. Right? That's and, fair. And getting that and that community which is a community like you said a community driven thing to adopt something new like calamari's which changes all the time is managed by an outside project so that's like it's not something that they develop in house that's something that they'd have to rely on something that's coming from uh, another developer which is not something that you always want to do when it comes to your installer cuz you know things break and it's not your fault and whatever Right. And, and especially when you have to have stability, like you have to, like Debian has to be stable. Otherwise it's not Debian, right? It, like if, yeah. Debian, if Debian became unstable or you couldn't install Oof. Debian, like it was, what's the point of even being a distro at that point? Right. It's, it wouldn't yeah. make any sense. So I understand from a, that position, why you don't want to take Calamari's and make it the default installer. That makes a hundred percent to me. It just feels odd that they've done it. Like they did the work to do it, 
Like it's mm -hmm. there. You can go download these things and use them, even if they do bury them. It, it just feels weird that they've done that work and then not really, you know, like hey, I'll, you know, here I'm you go, curious right? to know if I. You know, because, and I don't think I'm a good use case for this, <laughs> but, but, you know, cause I use the expert install all the time mm -hmm. and because I think that it's, I can just fly through it. And in five minutes I have, you know, base install done. And, um, but the truth of the matter is I wonder if it was even popular enough for them to continue in the development of that. If, because like I said, if we're not talking about newer users and we're talking about more, I don't, I want to say advanced cause that's just not right. You know, it's just, but more experienced users, then maybe they're just like, you know what? Screw that. We're just going to go with what these guys want. 85% of our, of our user base uses the expert install. So we're just going <laughs> to, we're just going to work on that. I don't know. I, I'm just throwing that out there, but you know, when you've got different use cases, you know, you could, let's put it this way. You can make a claim because you wanted to talk about what, you know, reasons not, reason against Debian. As far as enterprise is concerned, you've got a lot, of, you, you can't just, you know, you've got Ubuntu server, which is based on Debian, but then you also have something like CentOS, you know, that has specific stability um, requirements that people need for their, for their enterprise. You know, you've got Kali Linux and because you've got, you know, penetrating testing tools, penetration testing tools, and, and you've got immutable distros out there too. So these different use cases, not everybody can use Debian, you know, I think because of these use cases and, and, you know, to go back and say about, you know, talk about the innovation we need, we need as a community, things like Fedora, you know, that are on the bleeding edge. We need that so that we can like find our way in the future. For Deb, as a Debian user, I am appreciative of those bleeding edge software uh, distros because they're kind of leading the way. And there's like, okay, either this is going to be really good or this is going to be shite and we can steer away from it. So... Well, that's a good point because when without if Debian was the only thing, yeah, we'd, we'd never have lagging. Wayland or we wouldn't have you know Pipewire, we wouldn't have Pulse Audio, we wouldn't have System D. <laughs> I mean, we we we'd still be using Alsa. We'd still probably I mean, maybe even whoever was before Alsa. We'd still yeah. we we'd still probably be using Sy System Five, you know, as the NIST system. So. Um, so you're right there it, it, that other distros do need to use their users as guinea pigs because Debian would be unwilling to do so. Cause, I mean, that's just not the type of distro that it is, but I, I don't, th I, I, there's always use cases for other distros to be had. And, and I don't think that even in our facetious, facetious argument over, you know, Debian being the only distro, either one of us would be able to argue with a straight face that Debian could do what, you know, be everything for everyone. No, and it's then, impossible. And then actually have Linux be where it's at right now. That's just, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't work out well uh, for Debian or for us, right? It's, yeah, it's nonsense. Right? It'd be no, it's nonsense to think that the innovation, just looking at that one th feature, it's like, if you're talking about innovation, yeah, Debian's not the most innovative, <laughs> but it is the most stable and it has a lot of features and you know with rolling with a rolling release model like arch that is a test environment all the time so if those people that are on debian testing or sid they're kind of like they're kind of not only are they um they're running basically a rolling uh, a rolling distro but at the same time they're really providing a lot of information for the stable branch of debian that the when it does come out, when Trixie comes out in 2025, 20, uh, you know, we're going to have a, a rock solid distribution for another two years again. But, you know, you've got things like Silver Blue, you know, Fedora Silver Blue, and how that is changing things. You don't think that Debian has an eye on that and seeing what is that about? <laughs> what can we learn from that? 
even Nix OS, Matt, to your point, you know, when you're talking about Nix OS, you know, it's like, so that's an interesting package management system that Nix OS has going for them. Let's, let's not explore, do that. let's, <laughs> let's, yeah, let's, let's not let's, do that. <laughs> let's think about that for a minute. Uh, <laughs> nah. <laughs> well, the immutable thing is very interesting because it, it, I think that it would be, I don't think that we can ever foresee, I mean, you, you can't tell the future, but it would be very, hard to see Debian ever saying that's the direction we're going to go in as like yeah. the, the main thing right it, it, i mean maybe like 30 years from now i i could be proving wrong but anytime soon immutable doesn't seem like something that they would adopt right but because no. because debian is so flexible like you said earlier it's very conceivable that we could see the next wave of big distros being based on debian to be immutable so things like i mean ubuntu core exists that's going to be based on debian but it's going to be because it's still going to be ubuntu underneath it all but it's going to be an immutable distro it's going to suck because it's going to be all snaps but that's beside the point <laughs> that's beside the point but as the immutable train you know picks up steam not all of them are going to be based on Fedora. Like, like right now, that kind of seems like what it is. Like, yeah, yeah, we have MicroOS from OpenSUSE, or we're going to have Ubuntu Core. Uh, but in terms of actual, like, diversity of distros, right now it seems like they're all based on Fedora. And that's where the, the big work is going on. But that's the case with literally everything that we take it for granted in the, the Linux sphere. Like, you know, like we named them earlier. Pipe, you know, Pipeware, Wayland, SystemD, uh, Hell, Xorg for the most part. They a lot of a lot of the developers for Xorg over the years came from Red Hat and Fedora. You know, yeah. GNOME, like you you name it. A lot of the stuff that we use in Linux land came from Red Hat and Fedora. Same thing is going to happen eventually with the immutable stuff because I think that as that stuff gets fleshed out, and I, I think that the the big turning point there is going to be someone be able to explain why it's good for Joe Schmo. Like right right now, the Universal Blue guys do a fantastic job of explaining why it's really good for developers, and they do a somewhat good job of explaining why it's good for regular Linux users. What they don't do a fairly good job of, other than saying it's stable, which is something you can argue about a lot of distros, really. You know, they don't do a good job of saying, you know, hey, Windows user, come use this one because it's blank, blank, and blank, right? They, they haven't... That use case hasn't been explained well yet until it is, you know, we're not going to be there. But I think that eventually it will be. And then it will, we will see more and more distros because not everyone's going to want to base it on Fedora, like I said. So they're going to turn to the grandpappy again. They're going to go, you know, find him and bring him out and make it an immutable distro. We, we've we seen it before, kind of, only the movement didn't last very long it didn't grow as well we did because we, we the anti-system d movement is it's a movement there's not very many people who care about system d uh in terms of not wanting to use it but there are quite a you know there are a few out there and that spawned things like devlon it, it exists right it, spa yeah. it, yep. spa it spawns mx linux which is very popular according to 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 distro watch i guess the number one distro out there, right <laughs> <It's> true <laughs> all right it's got to be true it's on the internet right it's so, gotta so be. right so that type of that type of movement is just you know i i think that's something that will eventually cause will bring debian into the fold of the future the question then becomes what happens to debian over time because some of this some of the stuff maybe not the immutable parts of it but some of it is going to transition back into the main debian project because they all, yeah. all all this stuff has like you know uh, it's the next version right where everything is going to be based uh Wayland first right like every everything right is it because I, I mean i don't know i mean i think that that that's really the big question for me is to what level is debian going to adopt Wayland for the next cycle and is X11 even, I mean, I can't imagine XL. I mean, it's not going to be like Fedora where they're just going to go, mm -hmm. nope, that's it. No, it's We're still going to be there. Yeah. You know, it's no, it's going to be there. And so I'm going to be able to run my DWM with no problem for the, for the next three years easy. And that's fine with me. That's all I care about. I can, I can rock my DWM for the next three years with no problems. All right. I'm going to interrupt and, you there for just one second. Odds of Drew actually still being on DWM in three years. What do you think? 
Oh man, because there's so many other good XOR you know, window managers oh, out there. Oh, okay, you're saying <laughs> okay, okay. The likelihood of me going to a different X11 uh, window manager decent decent <laughs> it's a, that's a, a decent but i like i said i was working with sway all week and i'm like eh, it's good it's really good and really snappy and but not i mean okay let's do it this way the likelihood of me going to hyperland in within the next three years is probably more likely than me going to a different x11 district uh mm. window manager that I, that's the way i i at least think because of I mean, I, I played with it on Debian testing. It was very good. In fact, the configuration file for it is really, really it's good. It's very good. Okay. You know, we'll come back to Debian before we close out. But I, I have to, I have to talk about Wayland just for a minute because we're okay. So, my biggest problem with Wayland compositors, besides the fact that we, we decided we needed to rename them, right? They're window managers. People just yeah stop sure. it. But. My biggest problem with all that stuff is the bar. Like, I, Polybar is one of those things, like, it's fantastic. But I think Polybar is damn near perfect the way that it is, right? It's really, really good. It's easy to configure. You don't have to worry about YAML or CSS or anything like that. It just works really, really well. On Wayland, we don't have that yet. Like, Waybar is really good. But you have to know CSS in order to use it, and not everyone does. Now, they there are other ones out there, Iron Bar and G Bar, and don't talk to me about EW, like EWW is just don't, right? My biggest problem with the Wayland compositors is by far the lack of Polybar. <laughs> like I, if Polybar would just get get, get uh, ported over to Wayland, I'd probably use Hyperland by default always. Yeah. That's the way that I am. All right. Yeah. You know, okay, so I, I did think of one more thing in terms of like, you know how we we did, when we were looking for our distro of choice a few years ago, and we were distro hopping like madmen, you know, we we tried out something like Antergos, for example, which was based on Arch, obviously, but I fear at some point, and it's, I don't, it's probably an irrational fear, but you never know with these projects, and it could there be leadership issues or funding problems and and to put all your eggs in the debian basket would be kind of not a good idea all you know what i'm saying all the time because there is there's money and there's leadership and and, Politics, and granted yeah. yeah and granted yeah i think debian has the likelihood of sticking around more than anybody else but never say never either you know well, I mean, look at NixOS. They got, you know, they they are a well structured distribution too, and they just had a complete political meltdown. There, all their leadership are gone, and now, and you know, and all that was because of you know politics and stuff like that. So it could theoretically have I, the thing about Debian for me in terms of that. I mean, first off, you're right, and and I smirked when you said it because if that if for what what reason Debian meets its downfall, but let's just say it gets canceled for some reason or whatever, all the yeah. money goes away, Linux Mint is going to be fucking screwed because <laughs> both of their distros are basically based on Debian. Like Ubuntu would be gone, Debian yeah. would be gone, yeah, <laughs> they'd be screwed. I mean, we'd no, all they would be, be. We'd all be screwed, but I'd laugh because of the the the, the mint guy. <laughs> I'm so mean to the mint guys. Sorry, War Thunder. It's all right. <laughs> um, but if there was a situation, because because the community based distros are, I mean, you could argue it both ways that they're most more robust because they're community based distros and more likely to stick around, uh, at least after they reach a certain point. Like Debian's been around forever, therefore it has a a, a structure, as a governing policy. It has it has all the stuff that you need. It's like a registered business that can take money in uh, and actually do things and pay people with it's not like Hannah Montana Linux which is just a dude in his basement right you know yeah. you know it, it's yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's an established organization you can say the same thing about the arch guys kind of soulless Linux although they've had, they've had problems Manjaro is also one of the but Manjaro is actually a really good example of the things that can go wrong sometimes because while it is a a a uh, an organization that is fully formed and has a wide community and, and has all the governing structures that you'd want. They've also had a lot of infighting amongst themselves and had to fire some people and stuff like that. Had a lot of drama. Now, oh, that's a train wreck. Right? That's a train wreck of the leadership yep. at, at Manjaro. Horrible. 
the thing is, like you you see that with Manjaro. We, we've seen the stuff with Nix OS. We've we you know um, I mean you still have you have those things that go wrong, and then you have Debian there. Debian feels like the how am I gonna put this without pissing everybody off? Um, <laughs> no, you're <I'm>, worried. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I'm just saying Debian feels like the the neighbor on the street that. Uh, is the least offensive person you've ever met. Like they're, they're the they're the sprightly old grandmother who plays in their garden all day. How you doing? And, and, and I, like I said, this is gonna piss everybody off. But and there's nothing wrong with that that thing. A fine young person who plays in the in in the garden all day. They're just there. They don't offend anybody. They don't talk about politics or or you know which way the wind is flowing in, in current events they don't it doesn't seem to phase them what's going on in the world debian just remains as debian does and has for the last 30 years your point though is what happens if they decide if something starts affecting them from the outside they they have a they have a cocoon built but something comes in and affects them like they have had things like that before, but they've all been Linux related. Like the like Drew, I don't know if you paid attention. It was just a couple actually I think that this happened a few times. The system D argument has happened many times at, at Debian. Like they've argued about whether or not system D should be in there in the first place. And there's mm. there's a there's a, a a sizable portion of their uh, developer crew, I don't know the development crew, but at least of their community that don't think that system D has any place whatsoever in the Debian structure. And and they had a whole vote on it, like Two years ago, or something like that, before Bookworm came out, whether or not System D was even going to be a part of, of Bookworm, like it was going to be a thing, like they were going to, they they had it up for a vote for everyone to who was part of their system to figure out whether or not System D was going to continue being a part of Debian, and, that, and that's happened a couple of times. I don't know to that extent or not, but every time that, I mean, that's the kind of drama that it feels like Debian was built to sustain like it, it, it can get through those things because it's just de you know they're gonna make a uh, they're gonna make a you know like if something big comes along that way they put it to the community it'll get voted on and if it you know passes they'll adopt it if it doesn't pass they'll move on yeah. and carry on that's f yeah i think that well I, th like i said before though they're kind of looking around at other distros and going hmm, they've had problems with that <laughs> those guys those guys have had serious problems with that we don't need any of those problems so thank you for your testing for, for testing this out for us, and now we will move on yeah, sh from that. Showing for us what not to do. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and it, I mean, it sounds like we're I'm praising Debian, like oh, Debian's the perfect organization. Everyone should be exactly like Debian. And I'm, I, I, I mean, that's they're not I, the best, but they're definitely definitely not the worst. Well, I can tell you that right now. That's you know? true. And they, it, it's really so. The thing is, like, Linux has been around since 91, right? And then Debian came along in 93. And so of the distros that are out there, Debian has been around for basically the longest. Like, there's a few that are around the same time. And when something's been around that long in terms of, like, an organization, and they've done so in such a way that's kind of avoided controversy for so long. Like, it's kind of hard not to look up to them and say, like, you know, that's the way you do it. Like, the Arch guys have been around since the early 2000s, I, I, I think. I'm pulling that out of my butt, so I don't, I don't know if that when they actually came around. But, you know, they've been around for quite a long time. They've been at least 20 years, maybe even longer. And even they have had problems where their maintainers aren't necessarily the most transparent. They have a lot of problems and a lot of friction between the maintainers and the community, you know. And, and that happens a lot with 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 Arch. Um, you know, the, the Manjaro stuff. Obviously, we just talked about that. We, you know, we've heard a lot of stuff negative about Red Hat since they were acquired by IBM. They seem to have yep. a controversy every six months because of their their uh, money grubbing habits <laughs> yeah but they lie yeah, <laughs> That's yeah, yeah. The flat, they just right? flat out lie <laughs> i was trying to be nice okay yeah um so so the you know all you have all of these organizations like red hat's been around for red hat's been around for almost as long as debbie in like 95 or something like that and they haven't had the crystal you know pristine reputation that Debian seems to have and 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 that's just really impressive it's one of the reasons why I think that you because how we got onto this part of the, t the discussion drew was you talk uh, about why it's so easy for other distros to base on because you can kind of count on it to always be there and that's 
it, it feels like if the world were to end in the Linux community, I'm mean, like, like not completely like asteroid level extinction. And then we got other things to deal about, de you know, deal with. That's all right, uh, Matt. Go with the tin hat right now. <laughs> right? Go for it. Um, but <laughs> if, if, for, if for some reason, let's just say Microsoft decided that they're going to go back to the 90s and say, screw Linux, Linux is a cancer, and that we're going to sue them out of existence. It feels like, and it's not true, but it feels like out of everything that could survive, Debian would be the one that survived that event. Yeah. Right? It feels like that. Um, whether or not that, you know, you I know don't what the think... weird thing about it is, though, too. Let's say, let's, uh, this is the, tin, okay, let's go tin hat, tin, uh, tin foil hat, because G Linux, which is Google's Debian testing distro that they use in house. And all of a sudden, they want to throw a bunch of money at Debian and they go, you know, or they're going to let people, they're going to let people actually download the ISO, a G Linux, a Google Linux distro. And, um, and then they're going to pour more money into the Debian uh, foundation than, than is reasonable. And they'll have control over the leadership. Let's really tin, uh, tin foil had it and, and okay. that's where that's the end of Debian, my friends. That's... Okay. <laughs> the, 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 the funny thing is, it's not even that tinfoil hat because it's happening with OpenSUSE. So the there was a talk at one of the conferences recently, uh, one of the SUSE conferences, and the, the, a couple of the SUSE guys decided that are in control of SUSE decided to the open the open SUSE name was not good for SUSE. So there's this whole thing going on in the open SUSE community right now, th basically spawned by this conversation at a conference saying that the open SUSE should not ha use the name SUSE at all in their branding. So there's this whole renaming scheme going on in the open SUSE community. Like they're, they're trying to come up with whether or not they want to rename because it hasn't like the, the relationship between SUSE and OpenSUSE, technically, there's not a legal one. The the chairman of the board is always a SUSE employee. That's kind of the relationship. But theoretically, OpenSUSE is completely independent. It's a community-based distro, right? But they use the, the, like, the icons are exactly the same. The SUSE is obviously in the name of OpenSUSE. And they have... So it, it's quite clear that SUSE has quite a bit of influence on SUSE, on open SUSE. So I think though, the tinfoil hat thing for Debian, you know, they're a little bit more immune to it because they don't, they're not attached to any corporation, whereas open SUSE obviously is. But for years, it was assumed that open SUSE was just kind of like the golden child of SUSE. Like everyone thought that like SUSE liked open SUSE. It was a good idea. It, did, it was a good test bed of, of the software. Uh, uh, open SUSE leap is like a, is like the, the CentOS of SLE, the SUSE, SUSE Linux. And, you know, you know, everyone thought that SU that open SUSE was kind of like the golden child, but now it feels like they don't want it. They don't want it anymore. They want an association with it. So, I think what it all comes down to, Drew, is that the reason, one of the reasons why Debian has managed to maintain this pristine thing is because they just don't have, they're not attached to a corporation at all. And if Google did decide they were going to start doing what you said there, <laughs> I, I have a feeling that Debian would take umbrage with that. You know, it just feels like out of all of them, they would be able to thank you will take your money but we're only going to listen to you as much as everyone else does. you know yeah it, it, it feels that way anyways also uh war thunder <laughs> left a a super chat for five dollars thank you for the super chat debian's rock solid uh to build on nate all the way back i didn't read his uh, but he, i should have uh he said that uh drew you can do as many ums as you want because he's not editing this week uh, as the person who will be editing it um you're, you're doing fine it's not gonna be <laughs> any worse than mine so <laughs> <laughs> I deserve the punishment things tell it's, you know, <laughs> anyway. So th thank you both for the, the super chat. I truly do appreciate it. So in, ter in terms, just to wrap this up just a little bit, Drew, do you think, let's just ask this question. Where do you see Debian in 20 years? Well, I think the better question is, is it going to be any different? Mm. And I don't know that, that, that there will be any difference and they will not be Debian is a robust, and versatile distribution and mul you know it doesn't really foster i mean having the oh how should i put this okay so users 
have freedom to choose the system that best suits their preferences and requirements. And if we limited the ecosystem to a single distribution, that would undermine the benef the benefits and stifle the dynamic nature of the open source community. So with that said, Debian's going to be rock solid in 20 years and hope that everybody <laughs> and, and still looking you know, having one eye looking at the innovative distributions out there, but really still still focusing on what's important and stability and security. I, I don't know if that answers the question or not. Yeah, I but. think so. Uh, Nate left another super chat. He says, I've got a question. What would happen if Debian went away? I think we answered that. Um, we we kind of did, but Lin Linux it, it would be... <laughs> catastrophic in the, yeah. it would be catastrophic well, for multi i mean for 50 yeah. percent of the distributions out there basically well the arch guys would be celebrating because they'd be the they'd be grandpappy all of a sudden right um yeah although i, I don't think that they'd actually would because i think they'd be cousins marrying cousins a little bit but you know everything is so intertwined with each other like, like, there are certain things that just couldn't go away and have Linux still remain the same. Even if you don't use Debian or something based on Debian, you'd feel the effects of it being gone. Just like if Red Hat decided they were going to close source everything. Like, literally yeah. everything Red Hat does, they are going to close source it, right? <laughs> right? Linux Let's, would, Linux would yeah. be screwed. I, I mean, literally screwed. I mean, it would literally stop working or it would become proprietary or they'd have to license it or something along the lines like it, it would be catastrophic on a level we couldn't even imagine because like system no. d would be gone wayland would be gone pipewire would be gone pulse audio would be gone you know you name it like red hat has their fingers in so many different pies that if they took it all away we'd be screwed everyone would be using kde for one thing like, like oh my you know, like i know <laughs> like because gnome would be gone gnome, gnome is it, 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 yes gnome is a separate foundation but if you look at the crossover between them and red hat a lot of the finances and stuff for the gnome foundation comes well, from the developers too right I mean, developers, developers yeah yeah so the obviously i think if one of the two had to leave. Debian would actually be the easier one and the less catastrophic one just because of the underlying technology that Red Hat does. But so many distros rely on Debian to exist and so many developers use it. So many companies like, so we know Ubuntu would be gone. Linux Mint would be gone. Zorn would be gone. I, I, um, you know, so many distros that Amex. are just, you know, yeah. just out there would be just gone at least until they could figure out something else yeah. to be based on that, but uh, so i mean it would, it would be bad <laughs> it would be really bad <laughs> yeah i don't know what the, i don't know what i mean I, this is not something that is in my skill set at all but if debian server ubuntu server i don't know what share of the marketplace they have in comparison to like rocky linux alma linux or whatever the ones that are are kind of like in vogue, but you know, you got CentOS and so on. But I'm just saying from an enterprise perspective, it would also harm that area, not just users, but that area of, um, well, of enterprise. And even outside of the distro itself, a lot of the developers who work on Debian every day do so alongside of a whole bunch of other projects that they use to build Debian. A lot of libraries that go into Linux are, are, are their genesis comes from developers who are paid by the Debian uh, foundation or whatever they call it, right? The, the guys who control the paycheck paid those developers to do work on libraries that affect Linux, just like Red Hat does, only it's community based, right? And yeah. if, if that work decided, you know, they set the money dried up or whatever, and they can no longer pay those guys to work on those libraries, a lot of this stuff would then cease to exist. I, I mean, I, I think that. A lot of people make fun of Ubuntu for not being as innovative as it used to be and not and being too focused on snaps or whatever. But it, it, the same thing kind of happens would happen if Canonical decided to shut its doors. You know, a, a lot of stuff, a lot of the developers who work at Canonical do work on other projects that they're paid to do because Canonical wants them to do that work. And if they didn't get paid to do that, they'd go work on something else, which they could get paid to do. So... Uh, 
I, I think the bottom line of this conversation is that we need <laughs> we need Debian, we need Ubuntu, we need Red Hat. Uh, I don't think we need OpenSUSE as much as, as we want them to be because I want them to be as necessary as everything else, but um, we seem to just exist. <laughs> uh, still a good distro, though. All right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> gotta defend my open Sousa, man. It's, it's gotta... I, I have, yeah, I had no doubt. I had no doubt. <laughs> Anyways, that's it for uh, the main topic. Let's go ahead and move on to our nuggies of the week. So, Drew, do you have a nuggie of the week this week? I do, but I forgot what it was. I'm pretty sure uh, you said it at the beginning. Yeah, but I actually I changed it. Actually, I wanted to talk about. Well, let's talk about uh, the Sway Notification Center. This is not what I had planned, actually. Uh, but um, I think it's outstanding it's in terms of, you know, because like I said, I've been using Dunst forever. And to see something new that does notifications for window managers, uh, I think it's it's really, really kind of saucy and, and, and really good. Now, that wasn't what I thought. I was gonna say, but but let's move on anyway. GitHub Desktop was the thing you were going you replaced. It oh, with. thank you. Yeah, GitHub Desktop. So I'll I'll just double down and That's say fine. GitHub Desktop is something that I install literally every time I reinstall uh, my my Debian system, and it's because I suck at using like Git in the command line. And I'm able to have a graphic user interface that handles, and I because I use Git all the time for you know uploading and for doing you know not just notes but for a lot of the scripts that I write and so on. And even if I make like serious mistakes, you can go into there and just say, "Yeah, I didn't want to do that," <laughs> and, and just like undo everything in the uh, in the interface. So very good. GitHub Desktop is a must for me, at least. Yeah, I've used Git Kraken for the same oh, okay thing, uh, but it is proprietary. So, I, although I think that GitHub Desktop is probably also proprietary, I'm not sure. No, um, it's actually there's a guy Swift Key on GitHub that's oh. open source. Oh wow, that's cool. Then that's now it, it used to be yeah to to your point, Matt. It used to be that it was actually from GitHub, which was made it a Microsoft project, and this guy has a fork when it was open source and that is now hosted on GitHub and it's, and it's actually done by this guy called SwiftKey. Mm. And uh, I'll try to leave a link somewhere, some, somewhere so that you can get, if you're interested. Yeah, we'll make sure it's in the show notes. All right, uh, StitchyHD, for, thank you for the $5 super chat. Uh, they asked what would happen if Kali Linux, uh, as it was based on Debian, that too would disappear. I mean, it, if, if if Debian was gone, Kali Linux would... Do, I, I mean, we say disappear, but I mean, if they decide to shut the door, eventually some of these distros would come back based on something else. Or, and like, the previous versions of, of Debian wouldn't go away, so they could fork it and can carry, carry on the, the maintenance of Debian if somebody wanted to. Obviously, I don't think that it, it would... We don't think that it's actually going to go away, so... But still. All right, anyways, my nuggy of the week... Uh, what is my nugget of the week? <laughs> Distracted. <laughs> okay. Big note taking guy. I like to take notes. But I'm not good at sticking to one thing, but I'm I'm working on being better. I'm kind of developed, finally developed my system between using Obsidian and IOTIS and, and Nextcloud. I, I think the three of them are good, but I've gotten back into using Vim and I, I have started to want to use Vim or in this case, NeoVim more than obsidian but i still like the stuff that obsidian allows you to do every once in a while so having it all stuff in together is great but sometimes i want to edit something that was created in obsidian inside of neovim there is a plugin called the obsidian neovim plugin uh very creative to call and it allows you to do a lot of the stuff that obsidian does inside of neovim things like link between different notes uh so if you want to link between notes that are in the same vault you can do so you can add tags and do a whole bunch of other stuff that Obsidian does inside of NeoVim without having to open up Obsidian. And uh, it, it's really, really well together. There's a lot of features that I haven't gotten into yet. That I guess, like, they've done a, a lot of work to make a lot of the Obsidian stuff work uh, inside of NeoVim. It's awesome. You, if you use Obsidian but you also use NeoVim, uh, I definitely check out the plugin. Uh, and it, it's like quite good. So, yeah, that's cool. my nugget of the week. I will say that 
as I use NeoVim more to just do markdown stuff, I use the GUI stuff less than I used to. Now, again, remember, I was always a big Vim guy. Oh, yeah. So now that I'm getting back into Vim and NeoVim, I have found myself using the GUI stuff less. Like, I haven't opened up Obsidian actually in a, like a week. So okay. I have a feeling that the Obsidian will fall by the wayside. But because it's all Markdown, it will, it's easy to pull that stuff out. And I can continue to have my vault files inside of those directories. So if I ever right. open up Obsidian again in the future, all my stuff will still be there. So it'll still work just fine. So uh, Now, and, have you created new files using NeoVim and instead of like going in or are you just editing existing files using the NeoVim plugin? You can I've created some new ones and I've okay. edited old ones because it shows just markdown and the like the the big thing that I've been using right now is the ability to link between notes similar to like what you could do with VimWiki, but this yeah. is for uh, Obsidian instead of and you don't have to deal with stupid VimWiki files and weird yeah, yeah. VimWiki markdown because they don't want to, God forbid we just used markdown like it's meant to be used. I'm a little, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a little salty because I used VimWiki for a while, and then yeah. decided I didn't want to use it anymore. And getting the stuff out of VimWiki was a pain in the rear end. Yeah, a little salty, just, just a tad. All right, anyways, just, yeah, just, just a little bit. Uh, anyways, that is it for the Linux Cast. If you want to watch us live, you can do so. We do this every Tuesday at eight o'clock p.m. Eastern Time or thereabouts. We usually start about fifteen minutes late because time right am i right <laughs> that's time and nobody shows up on time anymore matt's always having to do the damn transforms and obs that so i just give me give myself 15 minutes extra uh, so anyways if you want to watch us live you can do so every tuesday at 8 o'clock p.m eastern time on the linux cast channel that's youtube.com slash the linux cast if you want to get in contact with us the best way to do so is probably via email that's email at the linux cast.org and uh, you, there you can contact me and I can transfer the email to whoever goes to. So if you want to contact Drew, I can pass that along or Tyler or whatever. You can do that uh, just through that regular email. That's great. You can also find all of our stuff on the linuxcast.org, which is the website. There you'll find episodes all the way back to season one. And uh, if, if, you, if you, you have or you plan to binge all the episodes of the Linuxcast all the way back to season one, uh, let us know, because uh, I'd love to talk to you. Like, what what'd you learn? What I learned when I went through and did it was that there is a host in the middle in the in the middle of the, the the trek here between season one and season eight that I don't remember at all. Like, there's a guy. Oh crap! That I don't even remember at all. He was there for like three episodes. No clue it is. <laughs> Just really weird. Also, Drew, your camera's completely on, man. Yeah, there you go. Um. Anyway, anyways, the uh. That, that was interesting. So you can find all the previous episodes there on linuxcast.org. Also, blog posts that I put there as well. Uh, Drew has a YouTube channel. He is Just a Guy Linux on YouTube, youtube.com slash Just a Guy Linux. And uh, you should definitely go over there, and if, especially, especially if you like Debian. His stuff, while he does branch out into other stuff, which is equally as good, his Debian stuff is just mm, priceless. Um, anyways, that's the best uh, compliment you're ever going to get, Drew. Priceless. <laughs> uh, anyways, you. uh, youtube.com slash just the guy Linux. And uh, yeah, we haven't seen that one before. Anyway, anyways, the uh, you can also find YouTube uh, support me on Patreon. Um, well, that's interesting. I'm not sure if I'm actually still streaming or not, because uh, as you can see, I've been disconnected. <laughs> uh, but anyways, youtube.com slash the linuxcast, patreon.com slash the linuxcast, and uh, yeah, I don't exactly know what ended up going wrong with the Jitsi, Jitsi call. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, I'm assuming that I'm not actually still online, but I still see you guys. Anyways, that's it for the Linux cast. We'll see you next week. Thanks to everybody who does support me on Patreon. You guys are awesome. Uh, without you, the challenge would not be anywhere near where it is right now. And um, I'm glad I waited until the end of the podcast to do whatever it is that it just did. So, um, anyways, uh, I got kicked. I don't, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the, the, the so, internet is, is, is as poor as shit is what it is. Anyways, thanks everybody for watching. We'll see you next time.